the purpose of the session is imperative um, to help you set up and understand fully what you'll be doing the remainder of the semester. There are essentially four different separate assignments that, that uh, are part of this larger whole, which is the, the argumentation research paper. The research paper itself, of course, is the major assignment, but you have the issue proposal, which was due last night, which I have reviewed, um, and more comments on that in a second. You have an annotated bibliography, which is a form of bibliography that I call a working bibliography that you compile as you do research, and we're going to talk briefly about that, but please be aware that there is a another recording, it's pretty brief, I think it's about 10 minutes that uh, is already in the week's 11 through 13 folder that already explains this assignment. So I'm not going to be redundant and repeat what that says, um, but I do want you to be aware you've got a, an assignment that you're supposed to do as you do your research. And I'm go going to model that for you at the end of this particular session. Um, the, so that's the, the third particular piece and then in week 14 you will have a um, another little exercise that has to do with avoiding fallacies and but again we will not talk about that until you're ready to start drafting your paper and now please be aware that next week is spring break um, so you have no assignments due if you notice in the weeks um, 11 through 13 folder, you have no assignment to do next week. Um, again, it is spring break. I will not be in the office. Um, so, I mean, feel free to email me, but I'll be, I will not be able to answer those emails until, uh, if I, I receive them next week until after I return because I won't be checking email. So I hope you'll take your break as well. Um, but there's only one potential assignment that you may have um, to do, and that is the definition right. If, um, it's very important that you go back and you look at my comments, both recorded and typed comments on your definition rights, because if you scored a 30 out of 50 points or below, then I'm giving you the opportunity to revise that particular assignment, okay? You've had a series of some assignments leading up to this one, um, beginning with the compare and contrast with research, the paraphrase, summarize, uh, summary and direct quotation assignment, the definition right assignment, um, the library scavenger hunt. All of these little pieces were stepping stones to lead up to this assignment. And if you're still not getting something right when it comes to documentation and incorporating source material, as evidenced by not passing that definition right. So again, a 60 out of, uh, I mean, a 30 out of 50 points is the equivalent of making a 60, okay, uh, if the paper were out of 100 points. So please be aware, that's not a passing grade. And what I want to do is to give you the opportunity to revise that definition right. Again, I've recorded feedback, I've typed feedback, and um, so you can go back. Now, occasionally some students did not pass the paper because they didn't follow all the requirements. Like, for example, you're supposed to have three sources, um, you know, that kind of thing. If that's the case, that's a different issue. But if the problem has to do with, I, I'm still giving you the opportunity to redo it, um, but if you have a problem, especially with plagiarism, intentional or unintentional, um, with your documentation formats, um, or with not meeting assignments, I'm giving you the opportunity to redo that assignment. And um, that will be due April, I think it's the 4th, that Monday that we return from spring break. So you can go ahead and get started on that and work on it. And I'm available throughout the week if you want to email me if you have any questions about it. Okay. Everything else, though, the um, annotated bibliography and the drafted research paper are not due until, I believe it's... Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll look at the, the due dates in just a second. All right. Uh, so again, I must emphasize how important it is that you watch the two videos as well as you know watch this live session. Take notes if you need to, uh, because quite frankly, if we were in a face-to-face -face class, what I'm trying to do is to compensate for the fact that we're not face-to-face. -face. And so I'm giving you all of the information that I give my face-to-face -face classes. Um, what I'm finding is that some of you are waiting to the last minute to do the work in this course, and it's not serving you well. You're not doing well. You're not succeeding. Um, you need to take the time 
time, especially for this last series of assignments, and put in the time to do well. Because in many ways, to me, this last assignment is the final exam for the course. I don't give actual exams, as you've noticed, and there will not be a cumulative final. Your research paper actually shows me everything you've learned about writing this semester. It shows me that you understand how to have an introduction that leads down to a specific claim or thesis. It shows me that you understand how everything's supposed to be connected to that thesis. It shows me what you know about documentation. It shows me what you know about um, showing rather than telling. It shows me what you know about using transitions to connect your information. So you can see how in many ways this, is, um, this final assignment is the culmination of everything we studied this, this semester. And that's the reason that it's worth 150 points. It's the most heavily weighted. Now I need to tell you though, uh, as far as research papers go, um, notice that it's between the, the word requirements, 1,250 to 1,500 words. That's still pretty short. Even though it's double the page, number of pages you've written um, or words that you've written so far for most of the formal essays, um, this is still a pretty short research paper. Okay. Now you might want to make a note of this. Um, a little bit shorter, let's say 1,100 words, um, not less than, but 1,100 words up to 1,500 words is okay, all right? Um, so, you know, again, if you think in terms of the target, the bullseye, as I've mentioned in the past, um, the, the target is, um, let me type this, oh, 1,750. The target is, um, <laughs> and I got that wrong. Again, sorry, it's hard to write and do this at the same time. Um, the target, the bullseye, is 1250 to 1500. And remember that this does include your, um, your references page. So technically, the actual content of the paper itself is, is going to be shorter than whatever your final word count is. But you can get away with 1100 words or up to 1750. If your final paper is shorter than 1100 words, then you need to do more research. You just don't have enough content. You, you haven't found enough to say. Um, if it's longer than 1750 words, you're not controlling your content. Um, you are writing everything that you find and, and you're not, uh, or else your thesis is too broad and you need to, to uh, make it a bit more specific. Um, so it's very important to me that because one of the goals again of this course is to teach students to write to fit any assignment you're given in any class. What, no matter the parameters, you learn to write to fit them. Okay. Um, all right. So point number two, and this is important, take a side on a clearly debatable issue. Debatable means that there is more than one opinion about the issue where there is a reliable, unbiased, factual support for both sides. Let me explain what I mean by this. A lot of times when people think of persuading other people or they think of, of arguing, they think in terms of sort of an emotional um, expression of your opinion. That's not what argumentation is. Argumentation is a more formal form of persuasion that follows a set of guidelines but actually is more fact-based than emotion-based. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so it means that it's not just people disagree because people can disagree and one side can be entirely wrong in what they're disagreeing about. It means there's actual support that can be, um, that's fact-based and unbiased and reliable on both sides. So for example, there are certain topics that are not debatable. Um, if you look at a topic like human trafficking, for example, human trafficking is not a debatable topic. <laughs> Okay. Who's going to say, yeah, that's great. That's a great idea. Nobody, right? Um, so, but there are aspects of it perhaps that can be debatable. For example, um, not enough is being done to counter human um, trafficking and therefore the laws should be more, uh, should be more serious or the, the consequences should be more serious. Um, that or is, is a more debatable topic. Okay, people would agree or disagree about whether or not enough is being done. Now, the first thing I had you do, and you've already done, is to write an issue proposal. You um, should not begin this paper and this research until you check to see if I approved your topic. Okay, 
If I did not, I explained why. A lot of times what happens is students, either the topic is too broad and you really need to narrow it, it's unfocused, um, so it's not clear exactly what it is you want to debate, or it's not that debatable. And part of the reason I have students write an issue proposal is so that I can kind of help, you know, check the check before you get started to make sure it's headed in a good direction, to make sure it is debatable, to make suggestions where you potentially can find information. Um, so please note, if your issue proposal is not approved, you need to write another one. Um, and I always recommend that students have a backup topic because even if your topic is approved, a lot of times what you find is once you get started um, doing the research, you may find that you don't really like the topic or you can't find what you want to and you may want to change. So my rec strong recommendation is that you always have a backup topic and in that case just email me and tell me kind of what you intend to do and we'll, we'll talk it out that way, all right. Now, your topic does not necessarily have to be controversial nor about broad political or social issues. I've had students write about issues that are more local. Um, I've had a, a student um, argue about the crime rate in her particular county and how she felt enough was not being done and so she actually went and interviewed the um, the particular um, sheriff. I mean, she she went to you know a lot of uh, effort to to try and to gather statistics. She contacted a a reporter um, for the local newspaper who actually covered kind of the um, this particular topic and interviewed him. Um, and so it was it was a local issue, and and she chose to. Um, examine it. I've had people who wanted to argue that one particular um, um, gaming system is preferable over another, okay? That is that is debatable, right? And um, so even though it may sound more like a compare and contrast paper, and in some ways it is, the goal was to prove a point that one was better than the other and to argue that point and to provide support for it. And so you can see how that's not a big grand and national issue. Um, now, I have eliminated these topics, and I've done so prim for one reason and one reason only. It's not because they're not good at topics. They are. It's because I've been teaching research writing for more than 30 years, and I just don't want to read these papers anymore. You know what I'm saying? A lot of students, this is the first thing they think of, and if they Google, you know, debatable topics, these are the first ones that come up, and so, um, or they feel very strongly about them. Now, animal testing, um, that one there was sort of a period of time, I may take that, that one off, um, simply because there was a period of time where that was a very popular and I got a lot of papers about it. That's not really the case anymore, so I may substitute something else. And it's just a, my personal preference. I'm tired of reading the papers, okay? Um, now, I, I do want to emphasize again that if I'm doing my job well, you will never know my politics, you'll never know my religious beliefs, you'll, because that's not my job. My job is to help you improve your writing, okay, period. So it's not a matter of how I feel about any of these, it's more a matter of I just don't want to read, you know, I'm tired of reading about it. Um, also, obviously, don't recycle a paper. Do not use research you've done for another class or another research paper you've written for an, an English class, you'll receive a zero. All right, here's the first requirement. You must use at least five separate sources that you find during the research process to develop this paper, okay? Um, now you can, you. I haven't put a cap on, uh, on the maximum, so as much research as it requires for you to uh, for you to do, that's what you do, okay? But um, I am putting a minimum threshold, which is five sources. And normally, if you're going to write a paper of this length using five sources, they need to be pretty good sources, right? Um, this is a requirement. Three of them must come from the GNTC databases or Primo, for, in other words, from our library resources, okay? Um, that's a requirement. Um, and here's why. It used to be that I let students, even after, you know, we've talked about evaluating source material and I've introduced students to the databases, I still have had students who have chosen to do all of their research, they'll just use Google and, and almost always those papers are not very good because students are not doing a good job of evaluating their source material. Please notice that if you will use the databases or a couple of the other sources I'm going to show you, 
um, you don't have to worry about evaluating it. The information is reliable. Okay. Now, one of these sources may be field research. There is a second video in the week's 11 through 13 folder that talks about research methodology. And the very first thing it talks about is what field research is. That's where you, the writer, also do a little bit of research on your own. There are three types of field research. One is conducting a survey. The second is through an observation with notes. And the third is through an interview. It's fine with me if you want to do your a, a piece of field research on your own. Um, please uh, look at that video to see what it what it means. Okay. Also, you probably need to define your terms. Usually, the second paragraph in an argumentation research paper is kind of either a history of the topic before you actually launch into the uh, argument itself, or it's um, you know gives some background information or it, you know, it's sort of a definition to explain exactly what you're talking about if it's a complex idea. Credo reference, which you used exclusively for the definition right, is a good starting place. But ne here, please hear me on this. Never, ever, 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 ever build an entire paper from credo reference sources. And here's why. It's like using, it's like you did when you were in elementary school where you just used encyclopedias, right? Credo reference is somewhat like that. It's much vaster, of course, but it's more encyclopedic background information. So it's a good starting place, but not, but you need to move on from there. And again, we'll go over the correct um, sources for that. All right, direct quotations. No more than most of the information in your paper should be summarized or paraphrased. In other words, written in your own words. Okay, you don't want a choppy paper that's 50% other people talking, right? And you just sort of connect what other people say um, with transition sentences written in your own words. Okay. Um, one of the goals of this course is to elevate your writing, right, to make it a little bit more sophisticated. And so sophisticated research papers are a combination of direct quotations in addition to summaries and paraphrases. Please, rem please remember, and some of you, you know, failed the definition right for this reason, anything that's written in your own words, if you got the information from another source, you still have to document it. Otherwise, that's plagiarism. It's not just if you copy word for word and don't put quotation marks around it, okay? Um, please remember that plagiarism exercise and that quiz that you took. Plagiarism is anytime you've got the ideas, sentence structures, or exact words of somebody else, and you use them without giving credit, all right? No more than 20% of your paper should be directly quoted. Now, I'm going to show you um, how to determine that. It's pretty simple. So give me just a second to set this up. It'll take a minute for this to um, show up on your screen. But this is from a previous semester. It's the student's draft of this argumentation paper. Okay. Um, and so you will notice here on the in, in red, and this is the case too. Um, as a matter of fact, if you go back to your definition right, and I say look at the red and give you a number on the right hand side of the screen, this is what I'm talking about. Now, of course, you don't have these tabs. I do. This is the instructor screen, but you do have this. All right. And so, if you will select the red, whatever, 18. What happens is when you submit a paper to turn it in, turn it in matches that paper. I tell it how many words in a row roughly to, to examine. And what turn it in does is it matches that paper to all of the student papers in its database from across the country, other colleges, universities. And then also the second thing it does is it matches it to uh, information online. So what this shows is that 18% of this paper has been directly quoted. All right, and so you can see here on the right hand side how this is color coded. If I scroll through here, all right, you can see where, all right, number three submitted to, I think this is Citrus College. Now, obviously, this student did not copy somebody else, other student's paper. He, she, and this student, student number, 
number three over here, just use the same source. But as long as you're using it well, it's not plagiarized, right? Okay, so quotation mark, healthy adult sleeps an average of, so it's copied word for word with quotation marks around it. It's got the in-text citation here. So this is correctly done, right? If you scroll on, you can see she's got another direct quotation. Here's her in-text citation. She's got another direct quotation. Here's her in-text citation. And by the way, a reminder, anytime you have a direct quotation, it must include the in-text citation. Even if the information after it, you paraphrase and it comes from this, you write it in your own words, but it comes from that same source. You don't wait till the end of the paraphrase to document. You have to repeat it. So for example, let's just say this information too, actually what the student writer did was make comment on what this said. So this is her, these are her own ideas, but this is a direct quotation. So here's the in-text citation. Let's just say if this had been paraphrased from this same source, this would still stay here and then it would be followed by Alec and Needston, Needston, Stead, 20, 2020, all right? Um, now, any place that you have words like this that are in the same order, this would have been considered plagiarized, and I would have written her, I would send her a note about this, okay? Because it's in the same order as the original. All right, so what I would have told her is, okay, this is a plagiarized passage. You, even with the documentation, you need to go back and put quotation marks around it. All right, so here's her, you know, another direct quotation. Here's another um, direct quotation. She's got her documentation. And again, all the documentation leads down to this page should have been titled references, which I told her. Um, it should have used a hanging indentation. That's the opposite of this. But it is alphabetized, okay? So um, this is to show you, and please hear me. I'm not saying the goal is to have zero direct quotations. Absolutely not. Uh, effective direct quotations are, um, are very important. It's just know when to use them, okay? An effective direct quotation is, um, you know, when you, someone's an expert or they're expressing their opinion, so let them do, let them talk. Um, it's when um, it's so beautifully worded that really you can't adequately put, put it in your own words without losing some of the meaning. Um, you know, there are times, you know, direct quotations call attention to themselves, so there are times when it's absolutely imperative that you use it, okay? Now, you do, we do want to use the same format. I am counting off if you're not using the right format anymore, because this is like, what, our fourth, fifth assignment? Um, so you do need to use Microsoft Word. Notice that you don't need a title page. Uh, black ink conventional 12-point font, conventional meaning Arial or Times New Roman are the two most commonly used. You need to double space between your lines. You need to use one-inch margins. You need to indent the first line of your paragraph. Some of you are still not using the right format, and it is going to count five points off your paper if you don't, okay? So please, make sure that you are using um, the correct page format. There are plenty of sample papers to follow. All right, you will submit a draft to me, and again, uh, I will give you feedback, more on that in a second. You do need a title that's relevant to the subject matter. And then you should have, um, this is some of the terminology we're going to talk about now that has to do with argumentation. So you need to have a clear claim, and claim and argumentation is simply the, the same thing as the thesis. It's the controlling idea. It's the main point that you are claiming and supporting. And you mainly want to support your claim with logical appeals. Okay. You can also use emotional appeals and if appropriate ethical. And so we're going to talk about what that means. Um, this, the second part of this number, we, I will discuss how to organize your information in the week 14 folder before you draft your paper. All right, so don't worry, we're not going to worry about this now. I've got a different handout, different information about this. So we'll get to this uh, when it's time to start drafting. You're at the point now where you're ready to start collecting information. Okay, but let's talk about argumentation for a minute, formal argumentation and what it means. Okay, argumentation, 
The definition is an argument is comprised of assertions designed to convince readers to accept an idea, to adopt a solution, or to change their opinion. And also to take action. I mean, that often, an that's part of what an argument does is it's trying to claim that some action needs to be taken. The claim is the author's point of view, which is your th thesis or focus, about the topic. This is the reason it's not just about your opinion, because notice the emphasis on, um, on the audience. The point of argument entirely is to convince people to agree with you. And how many times have you heard people expressing their opinions and it just made you mad? There was nothing there that actually wanted you to cause you to want to think about it, especially as polarized as our culture has become with everybody kind of in their respective camps. You know, it's very easy to be off-putting to people uh, if you demand your side without uh, actually providing some type of logical support for why someone should listen to you. Um, so uh, argumentation actually started with the ancient Greeks. Um, and the ancient Greeks, um, the way, you know, the way that their particular um, political system worked was that free men um, could vote, but the way that they uh, attempted to persuade each other was by standing on the, on the street corner and, or in, within, you know, the, uh, the Acropolis or some, uh, some other um, structure and, you know, are trying to argue persuasively. And so um, the, the rules for argument uh, were established and codified, and codified simply made sort of, sort of, you know, right means a written form of, of uh, a formal version of the rules were codified by Aristotle. So that's where a lot of what we get um, when it comes to argumentation. Uh, that's where a lot of the language and the understanding comes from. All right, so um, logos is the first form of um, of appeal. Okay, and logos is appeals to logic. And okay, notice they have the same root. And I like to think of it as appealing to your head. And types of logos are things like facts, statistics, eyewitness testimony. Expert opinion, and notice the emphasis on expert, not just opinion, but people who have the credentials to actually comment, okay? All of these are types of logos or types of logic, and this is primarily what you're looking for here, okay? Um, you're looking for, uh, when you do your research, you're looking for, for information, uh, examples, okay? Um, laboratory results. You're looking for fact-based information that will support what you want to say. Okay. Um, so most of your papers should be built on logos. Think about being in a court of law. And um, in an argument in a court of law, think of that scales of justice. What you're trying to do is weigh down one side of the scale with logos and so forth. Um, usually in trials where there's a judge, that's what the, uh, but the, uh, the prosecutor and the defense attorneys are trying to do is to persuade a judge through all of these types of things to rule in their favor. All right. Now the advantages to logos is um, are these: it provides evidence, right, and it can be verified. Um, so it's not just somebody winging, saying whatever comes to their mind off the top of their head. You can go back and fact check it. The disadvantages, however, is that the readers have to pay attention, and sometimes, especially the more complicated or technical or abstract the subject, the more difficult it is to verify the information. Now, the second type of appeal and argument is called pathos. And pathos appeals to your heart, let's say emotions, okay? It offers support to an argument by using images, sensations, or sometimes even shock techniques to lead people to react in a certain manner. And pathos plays especially on our desires and our fears, all right? 
Um, and these are certain types of desires and fears here. Self-expression, our desire for money, our desire for fame, our desire for recognition, our desire for independence, our desire to be unique, or our desire to conform and not stand out, our desire for friendship, or our, our fear of not being in. Um, we want to be recognized if we've been through something. Um, our fear of not being popular, our fear of not being accepted, or just, you know, you can flip that desire as well. Um, and so um, pathos is one method of trying to convince people to agree with you, but here's the problem with pathos. And it can be very powerful and very immediate response. Um, but the disadvantage is, is that the uh, one is that the uh, re response may be short lived, it may backfire, and um, often it's very difficult to support with fact based information. Um, almost all advertisements um, are built on pathos of some sort. Uh, our fears and desires, our desire to, you know, in a beautiful car, dress well, whatever it may, have perfect teeth, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but notice that it can be back, if it's heavy handed, it could backfire. I, I think of that commercial um, put out by an organization for the protection of animals. Uh, and it's a legitimate organization, but it's, it plays that song by Sarah McLaughlin in the background, um, you know, the arms of the angels and all that. And it shows this abused dog in a cage. And quite frankly, it's, it, it, you know, anybody with half a heart, you just, your heart goes out to that dog. But the reality is the goal of that advertisement is to, that commercial is to get people to send money. I quite frankly won't watch it. If it comes on, I will click off of it immediately. It has the opposite, um, probably the opposite reaction that, that the, um, those who created it desired. Does that make sense? It's easy to manipulate people through fear and through desire, and we'll talk more about this uh, in week 14 when we get on get to fallacies. Um, so use it in a limited way in your paper, but examples of things that happen to real people can definitely produce a certain effect. You just, and it can also be a form of logos because it's verifiable. You just don't want to be heavy handed with that or only rely on pathos, on appealing to emotion. Now, finally, ethos. Ethos has the same root as the word ethics. And so this is more appeal to what I would call your spirit or your conscience, your sense of right or wrong. And um, so it has to do with, and this is very important, shared values. Your audience has to be on the same page with you for ethos to work. All right? And I'll explain that in a second. There are essentially f um, three realms uh, for I mean, four realms for, for ethos, religion, patriotism, humanitarianism, and standards. Religion is obvious, all right? But you can't assume that your reader, and I'm going to be a neutral reader, but you, so you can't assume that I share your religious beliefs. Or even if we have share the same form of religion, um, as you know mentioned recently, there there I think now 85 and these are just registered 8,500 different types of Christianity. All right, so I may be I might consider myself a Christian, but I would not necessarily be on the same page. In Judaism, there are um, there is the orth there are the Orthodox, there are the Reformed. Um, you know, and each has its own set of, it has a, a similar base, but each has its own set of beliefs and so forth. Um, so you can't assume that there's no point in appealing to religious um, argument if your audience already is not on the same page with you, because it's not going to work. As a matter of fact, you may offend your audience. And in argumentation, the goal is to convince your audience, right? Patriotism. Some people are more patriotic than others. Some people, it's my country, love it or leave it you know, and it's how they define patriotism. Others define it differently. And so again, if you are not to use the old, this is a cliche now, but preaching to the choir, it's not going to be effective. Humanitarianism is simply that, that sort of code of how you treat people. And there is some overlap with religion, but it's how you, how we believe people should be treated. Um, like for example, 
in America, we tend to have certain sets of religious beliefs for children, I mean, not religious, but humanitarian beliefs about how children should be treated and at what ages, you know. Uh, in other countries, you know, children go to work at the age of eight, you know, they start helping support their family. So you can see how that's more of a, a cultural um, standard. And then standards themselves, if you work for any company, um, any business, any group, uh, unless for yourself, there are a set of standards. Uh, for example, there's a certain way I'm supposed to dress. <laughs> there's a certain way that I'm, especially when I was a K, uh, uh, taught high school, um, in, in our contracts, there was what was called a moral turpitude clause, which basically said, you know, you will not behave, especially in public, in certain ways uh, that would be considered inappropriate uh, when you're supposed to be a role model for these students. Um, so, um, you know, what some some jobs care more about what time you get to work than others. Some have a dress code. All of those are standards that you're supposed to follow, and that all has to do with ethos, shared value system. Okay. Once again, ethos honestly does not work well unless your audience is um, shares your values. Otherwise, your paper will not be effective. And I'll tell you that if you happen to write from one of those perspectives, okay? Because you have to consider um, me as sort of a neutral um, audience. Uh, one of the great things about ethos is if you are on the same page, and again, that's a cliche, um, but if you, your audience is in agreement with you as far as standards go, then it can be very powerful. But again, it only works if your audience shares your value system. All right. So I hope that kind of helps you understand a bit better the types of information that you are should be looking for. Primarily fact-based statistics um, and so forth. All right, a couple of a uh, couple of other um, pieces of information here that I want to emphasize. Again, I'm your audience. Some of you are still using very informal language. You got lots of contractions, um, abbreviations, and so forth. Please stop, okay? Because it really will impact the grade on the paper. Uh, again, we had that diction lesson. You're supposed to be aiming for that mid-level of diction, um, which is standard American English, which is not so informal. The hardest way to approach this assignment is using Google or Bing or Safari. Honestly, it's the hardest. Um, but I'm not saying you can't do it. You just have to make sure to evaluate your source material. And I'm going to show you better options in a minute. Uh, documentation, of course, same as we've been using in the paper itself within text citations for all paraphrases, summaries, and direct quotations. That will tie then um, back to the references page. Please note, I can't pass the paper. You cannot make above uh, 75 out of 150 points if you have plagiarized portions. Uh, fallacies we'll talk about, uh, it will actually be week 14. Um, diction, again, my repetition that you need to avoid using you, directly addressing the audience like you're giving instructions. All right, and then our timetable, um, your draft of this paper is due Monday, April 18th. My feedback will be available the following Thursday, and the final paper is due on Monday the 28th. Um, I've left about a week in here so we can play with these due dates if we need extensions. Please be aware of that. Just let me know before the due date, all right? But there's a little bit of extra time that I've built into this schedule so that should you need it, um, we can take it. Okay? All right, let's talk for a minute about note taking and so forth. Essentially, researching the, the act of researching is a um, a form of pre-writing. <laughs> you're in for, you're collecting information just like you did when you free wrote, just like you do if you use a cluster diagram, just like you know if you're listing or whatever. Researching is a form of pre-writing.
okay? So it's the planning stage, it's the earliest stage, and usually you begin with some type of question that you want answered. That's the reason I wanted you to uh, end your um, issue proposal with questions, to start thinking about what do you want to answer with this um, research. If they're good questions, usually they lead to your tentative thesis, tentative meaning subject to change, okay? And the way in which you answer those questions is through researching your subject. Now, I want you to do an annotated bibliography um, of the materials that you consult. Uh, again, that assignment along with a sample annotated bibliography along with a short video that explains it, which please watch all of that. Um, this is a document, it's, it's a working document that as you research, you compile, okay? Um, so. A references page is a more formal bibliography. These are the works I referred to in my paper. But it's only beginning writers who think that, um, okay, I'm required to have five sources, so they stop after the first five, okay? Um, so what the, what the annotated bibliography requires of you is to, as you research, create a bibliographic entry, right, a full reference, um, bibliographic reference for each source that you consult, even if you're not going to use it. Okay, so hear me. It's like a it's like a research document that it almost um, it's a way to to um, like document your process. And so what you do is you create that you you um, what I do is actually have a Microsoft Word document open, and then the first thing I do if I'm going to scan a source and see if I'm going to use it as I, um, for, for an annotated bibliography, is I copy, you know, hopefully if you're using the databases, you've got a citation tool that does it for you, so you just copy the bibliographic entry, and then underneath that, after you've scanned it, read through, you write a paragraph talking about whether or not you think this was, you're going to use the source. I find this source very interesting. It's got statistics that I might could pull into, blah, blah, blah. Um, or I don't think this source is, so notice that you, you include it whether you think you'll use it in your paper or not, all right? It's not the same thing as your final references page. Your references page are just those sources you use in the paper. The annotated bibliography is a record of all of the sources you look at and whether or not you think you're going to use them, okay? And for it, I'm asking you to have eight to ten separate sources, okay? Eight to ten separate. Again, you don't have to use all of them. You probably won't, but it shows, it's, it documents your research process. Whenever possible, use primary sources, sources that contain first-hand information, okay? Um, secondary sources are comments, commentaries, descriptions about primary sources. So um, I'll show you more on that in a second. Also remember you can conduct your own research, known as field research. You don't actually put field research, though, on your annotated bibliography. And again, there's a... Um, a uh, recorded video that will explain this. Finding source material, remember Credo Reference is a good starting place. Facts on file I'm going to show you a little bit about. And Primo, um, the card catalog. Um, also, Galileo, I want to show you something about that as well. Google Scholar. Now, Wikipedia references, not Wikipedia itself. All right, and please remember that using a popular search engine such as Google or Bing is the hardest way to do this. So let's first go to, um, let me make a comment about Wikipedia. Give me a second again to set up. It takes a minute for this to, um, for this to appear on your screen. As you know from probably any English teacher class that you've had in the past, um, you are advised not to use Wikipedia to build a research paper. That includes this paper as well, okay? Again, a wiki is a, um, is a public site that can be changed by anybody. It's, it's built by the public. Okay, uh, but it doesn't mean it doesn't contain good information. It's often a good starting place. And let me show you what it's really good for. Let's just say that, um, um, that I am going to, uh, my topic for my paper, I want to argue that um, 
I want to argue that online dating po poses more risks than rewards. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that, that's just what I'm going to start out with thinking I'm going to find out. All right, online dating. Okay, here's what Wikipedia is good for. All of these different blue search terms, you can come up with different words to help you look up information. Um, so let's see, uh, gives some background, talks about some trends, um, gives me some examples of different dating sites I could maybe use or check out if I really wanted to go that far. Um, and then at the very end, here's the second thing that um, Wikipedia is good for. It has a collection of references because Wikipedia is a secondary source made up of all these primary sources. Here are the originals. And I can even tell just by looking through this that some of these sources are reliable. There's the Pew Research Center. That's a reliable source. Um, a Scientific American is a reliable um, science magazine. Um, so I can then select that and then go, you know, so it can help me find other information. All right, so that's one thing that, that Wikipedia is really good for. All right. Um, let me see if there's anything else I want to show you on this PowerPoint before I show you a couple of other potential sources. Ah, Google Scholar, yes. I don't know if you've ever used Google Scholar before. Um, and I think I've got a section, on, a very short section on this, so I'm not going to go into any kind of detail. But Google Scholar is a great place um, because it's more like a database contained on Google of, of um, reliable information. All right. Um, so let me show you. How, it's not my favorite, quite frankly, uh, as far as the interface and how easy it is to use. Um, I find it a bit more difficult to use, quite frankly, um, than using the GNTC databases. But I will show you. It doesn't have as many uh, filters, so you can like change the information. Um, let's stay with my online dating. Uh, 20 years of online day. Notice right here, the only filters I can really change on the, here on the left-hand side is, let's just say since the, the date range, um, let's see, the role of psychology in understanding online trial. That sounds kind of interesting, so let's see what this is about. I'm going to select it. Here's the article. Um, There's the abstract introduction, but notice it's not going to give me the entire article. I have to pay for it if I want it. Okay, so that's problem number one. Just because something is contained in Google Scholar, it may just be a, a, a synopsis, an abstract, a summary, right? It may not be the entire article. All right, so that's problem number one. Um, let's look at this new systematic review. There's my abstract. Okay. Now, one of the good things, though, about Google um, Scholar is that I can actually download the, in, the entire article, uh, and I think it also gives me the option, let's see, seven citations, abstract, at least it had um, the ability to use, um, it, it too has a, a references page at the end, and it, I thought there was also, oh, there it is, citation tool. Cite this article. And so um, all I have to do is copy this. Although this is not actually written in APA format, so I would have to take it and revise it and make it into APA format style. All right. It looks like a modified format. So I'd have to change around the information. All right. So please be aware that's another option. The last thing that I want to show you. Oh, about note taking. I am not requiring that you take notes. Um, just be sure that you are um, thinking through the information as you work with it. That's very important. Um, the last thing that I want to show you is on the DNTC library website. Two things with which you may not be, uh, that we may not have covered yet. 
All right, so give me a second to set this up and then we'll be done. Okay, the first is you may have used um, in the past Galileo, which is um, the Georgia University Systems compilation of all these databases. I find it easier, quite frankly, to use than Primo. Um, and so let me show you why. It's got more filters for one thing. So, but the here, but they've kind of hidden it here on the library page. So the way that you find it is here under Resources and Guides, and I'm going to select Galileo Homepage. Okay, may take it a minute to find that. Let's see. Okay, so here is um, here is the Galileo homepage. This particular database, Academic Search Complete, is a wonderful database. It's broad, it's expansive, it's got a lot of stuff in it, okay? So I'm going to open it, and notice that it gives me all these different filters that I can use to limit my search, okay? These are called Boolean operators, uh, after um, someone's name. Um, so here is, um, let's see. If I'm going to do online dating, and if I want to narrow it down, I use the word and, okay? And let's just say um, scam, scams or fraud, okay? Um, now, that narrows it down. If I change this to or, it will broaden it because it will give me everything that includes both the t oh, either term. Um, and means it has to, all the articles have to include both of them. Let me show you some additional ways to change this. I want full text. I don't want just a summary, right? I need to see the whole thing. I want the article. Okay. Uh, again, PDF full text. I want, I'm going to narrow it down to, um, Let's just say the last things that were written in the last 2017 to 2022. I want periodicals, which of course means those um, publications that come out you know, regularly, either daily, weekly, or monthly. I only want English. I don't want every, every, things published in other countries, right, or other languages. So notice that I can already really narrow down um, what I'm, the articles that I get back. I'm going to select search, and I've got four back, okay? Um, so again, here we have um, the summary. I can find my full art, the full article here. HTML means it's stripped down of any pictures or, or whatever. It's just the text. PDF means this is exactly how it was published. Also, remember I've got citation tools here, so I can I can print this article. I can email it to myself. I can save it. Um, somewhere, a jump drive or to, uh, to my hard drive. I can, and here's my citation tool. So when you select cite, cite all right, you want to make sure you're using APA, but all you have to do here is copy and paste. All right, so this should give you plenty of information, uh, plenty of, of ways to go about um, conducting your research. Please get started. Do not hesitate to contact me if you have questions. Um, and the starting place is to go back to your issue proposal and look at that again.